Yeah. Well, it got quiet. But <laughs> they ate magic twice. Yeah. I've got Linda coming in. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. It's 1130. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, it's good to see some old faces. It's, I won't say old faces, some returning faces, <laughs> and some folks that are new to our little session here. Uh, this particular session is what we call a show and tell. If you remember back to fourth grade when you used to bring in something and actually show it to your friends, you know, in class and so forth. That's kind of what this is. It, it grew out of something we did over at TCHA for a number of years where we'd informally kind of get together and people would just bring in collections, something out of their collection to share with people and kind of learn things. But uh, what we do is we're going to do our little show and tell part for like five minutes here at the beginning, and then we'll get into our presentation here. But what we say is we, we try to guarantee that you will leave here knowing something you didn't know when you came in. It may be from something you hear from me, or it might be something you hear from somebody else in the audience. So welcome to that. A couple of things I'll announce also is that our new 2023 program guide uh, has just come out, and I've got some up here on the table. If you want to stop by at the end of the program to actually see uh, what we have and see all the cool programs we have coming up this year. A uh, wide variety of things, everything from trying to cover all ears of Tippecanoe County history. So that's, that's a fun thing coming up. Um, Jeff, anything else we need to talk about at this point? Jeff Schwab over here is our board president of Tippecanoe County Historical Association. We have our um, treasurer sitting next to him, Loretta Bill. Behind him is board member David Hovde. Hold your hand up there, David. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, and we've got other folks, in, and uh, so a lot, of, a lot of fun things going on. So well, let's go ahead and get started with the show and tell. Now, I know Mary brings in something. You've got something for us. What did you bring in today? Okay. I got a couple of questions. One thing. I found this in the library's last book sale. It's called Wheat Notes. And come to find out when I opened it up, it's all the 1970, this is 1975 uh, brochure from the feast. And then when I opened it up, there are newsletters from 1975 to 81. What I want to know is how did we get the name Wheat Notes? Do you know? It's not Wheat. What's it called? We are. We actually are not. I was trying to read it in. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, okay. it's, spelled, it's spelled differently, obviously, than how we pronounce well, how we spell it with the right. French spelling. Right. You know? right. But yeah, when you phonetically sound it out, it's we had two notes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I opened it up and I thought, that's mine. That's three dollars. How it got to the library, I don't know. But I have had a blast just going through it and reading stories about events that has happened through TCJ over all these years. And my big one that really caught my eye was. Get my notes down. In 1976, there was an article put out about the 1900 um, Lafayette dollar, and it was it was manufactured by the Mint as a fundraiser for the monument that was going to be placed in France about Marx de Lafayette. So on one side of the coin is Washington, and on the other side is Marx de Lafayette. Um, it was um, encrypt it was designed by Charles Baker. There was fifty thousand of them made at two dollars a piece, so that's a hundred thousand dollars. Plus what they had raised locally it, that was used to build and to present that monument in France. So I got anxious and started looking on newspapers.com, and this is when I found tons of information. But anyway, um, it was the very first coin that was produced was taken to France, March the 5th, 1900. And it was presented to the um, president, uh, Marc Lebeau. Um, and it was placed, it was taken at the um, Essex, Essex Palace. And inside there, he presented it to him. The coin itself, now it doesn't give much of a description. It said the coin was placed in a coffin. Now, what size coffin, I don't know. What size coffin, I don't know. But it was put in um, French, it was done in stainless steel and French gray. And the thing cost $1,000 to build this particular coffin. And then it was taken and placed in a vault. So it's somewhere in that palace. Um, so that was pretty awesome. And I mean, I found tons and tons and tons of articles about it. It was, it was quite the thing to have happened. Now of that 50,000, in 1945, there was over 1,600 of them that were melted 
and step back to the middle. Being silver, I would assume 45 and being four times, maybe possibly what it was at. So, the, and I know TCJ had one. Um, on when I went to look to see about how they how much they run, they went from 400 to 1200 dollars to buy one, depending on who's selling them, what condition it's in, whatever, whatever, whatever. But it's pretty awesome. I just was so excited about seeing that. But it was um 50,000, that's a lot, but if you lose half of them or almost half of them, well, there's not much left. So if anybody ever finds one any day, grab it. <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say. Grab it. So this is the one of the things that really caught my attention was this, this coin. Not that I'm in, into coins or anything, but I just thought that was just so cool. So I'll pass the book around. And there's a the little stickers here and there that are here of bits and pieces. And there's even a couple annual reports, 1974. <laughs> So that would be interesting to yeah. I've read so much and I've learned so much. It's been so cool to learn some of this back history about TCHA in the 70s, early 80s. Very good. So Very good. I'm sure there's more copies of these now. I'm sure you guys have some probably, tucked away. Probably, I'm going yeah. to check that's with Kelly. Email yeah. 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 Kelly and ask her. Yeah. But anyway, um, it, was a, it was a group um, that had this. It was the Wallbash Valley and, and Rogers group. So, you know, somebody was president, members. So they got all these awesome, 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 awesome pictures. Well, thanks for bringing that so up. I, I just jumped on that like a cat. Completely on a dog. <laughs> I even found out that that big book that I brought in, the Atlas, mm -hmm. that was represented. I found out the information about that. The book was originally in, what, 1878. Mm -hmm. It was reprinted in 1978 mm -hmm. right. for $15. Mm -hmm. Or 23 if you wanted the hardback. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I just so I just made a copy of that and stuck it in my book. I mean, I have found so many articles. It's just been so much fun to read that, to learn that history. It's just excellent. I get so engrossed in it, but it's so cool. It is. It is so, very good. Very we're glad good. to share it with everybody. Well, thanks for bringing that in. Uh -huh. uh, which brings up a really important point is that every day we find history is ending up in the dustbin, literally. Um, I make it a point to kind of go out and visit Randy Ramsey out there on 26. You know where that is, <laughs> because Randy gets something in. You know, and I'll go and look. He'll he'll hand me a box that contains a family's photographs all the way back to you know the 1880s, and it's being lost. It basically was in Grandma's attic when she died. They didn't know what to do with it. They brought it into Randy. They got 10 bucks for it, and those pictures. Who knows what will happen to it. So if you run across history, you know, feel free. Typical County is designed to curate, preserve history, and share the history with people. That's really our mission. And so by doing that, it, it helps to preserve history that way. And all of us here are kind of in a way of capturing that history and making sure it isn't lost. So that, that's my little public service announcement for the day. Okay. Did anyone else bring anything in for us today? Okay. I don't see any hands, but okay. But now, since many of you here are, are here for the first time, you know, now you know what we do when we do this show and tell. So feel free to bring things in. Now, we're going to talk about an interesting character. And he was indeed an interesting character, Harvey Washington Wiley. And he has a connection to right here in, um, at West, in Lafayette and Purdue University. And we'll get to that. But he really was part of a, a larger issue that was in the United States. So we'll get to that in just a minute. But <clears throat> Started out with a little poem. We sit at the table, delightfully spread, and teeming with good things to eat, and daintily finger the cream-tinged bread, just needing to make it complete, with a film of butter so yellow and sweet, well suited to make every minute, a dream of delight, and yet while we eat, we can't help but asking, what's in it? <laughs> Oh, maybe this bread contains alum or chalk or sawdust chopped up very fine or gypsum and a powder about which they talk terra alba just out of the mine. The pepper contains coconut shells and the mustard is simply cotton seed meal and the coffee in truth of chicory smells and the terrapin tastes like roast veal. The banquet, how fine, but perhaps don't begin it. So you think of the past and future and sigh. I wonder, I wonder what's in it. And these are all things 
that were in the food. And it's a poem by Harvey Wilde that was done 1899, about halfway through his career, his professional career. Well, mid 19th century, so we're talking 1850 to 1860, long time ago, but we oftentimes think of our ancestors as growing up on farms and having farm fresh produce and farm fresh milk and farm fresh uh, meats and so forth, and you know, very wholesome sort of attitude towards that. But the problem was in that same period of time of 1850, 1860, we had cities. And cities were growing and burgeoning with the Industrial Revolution and people flocking to cities for jobs and immigrants coming into the cities and so forth. And these people lived nowhere near farms, which meant that you started to have the problems with getting food into the cities that were nowhere near the areas where you actually had the food produced. And by the mid 19th century, many foods and drinks sold in the United States had an earned the reputation, a justifiable reputation of being untrustworthy and dangerous. For example, milk, staple, obviously the food of choice for every young child to grow up with big, bold, strong, you know, strong bones and muscles. Well, dairymen supplying the crowd of cities realized it was pretty easy to make a better profit margin if you diluted out your milk with one part more lukewarm water with two parts milk. Now, remember, we didn't have pasteurization back in the day. This is raw milk and oftentimes contaminated milk with bacteria. Diluting it out, in some ways, actually fostered a little bit better growth of bacteria in there. So to remove the bluish tint and make it more palatable, they will oftentimes add plaster of Paris or chalk to make it more white. And since they skimmed off the milk fat in order to actually use that for other things, well, as it kind of went along, they sometimes would add a dollop or two of molasses back into it to kind of give it a golden color, you know? And then to replace that cream that they had taken off the top, they would add a squirt, literally, of some yellow fatty substance, oftentimes pureed calf brains. That was your milk. In 1853, this got to be such a problem that John Mullaly published evidence of milk adulteration that went widespread throughout the city of New York City. It included reports from frustrated physicians who stated that literally, quote, thousands of children are killed in New York City every year by drinking dirty and, de and deliberated, deliberated? I don't think it's the right word, tainted milk, or deliberately <laughs> tainted milk. Despite the outrage, however, no laws were passed. Why? Because the people who controlled the purse strings had more power than you or I in making changes occur. So in contrast to this time in Europe, Europe had already enacted laws to regulate materials that could go into food and drinks. But for the United States, it wouldn't happen until 50 years later. Well, there was big money to be made in cheap products, adding cheap ingredients to adulterate foods in the US, and you could do so legally. There was no law that said that you could not. It was buyer beware. Honey was usually just thickened corn syrup. Sometimes a honeycomb was thrown into it to make it look uh, authentic. Vanilla? No vanilla in there, no vanilla bean. It was just alcohol and some brown coloring agent of some sort. Strawberry jam, mashed apples, grass seeds, that's for the strawberry seeds that you would expect to find, and a little bit of red dye to make it look like it was strawberry. Now, coffee, pulverized sawdust, wheat, beans, beets, peas, dandelions, chicory, anything that you could burn and basically simulate ground coffee was what went into your coffee. Rarely. Or their coffee beans. And pepper and spices, <laughs> coconut hulls, charred rope, and occasionally floor sweepings. This is what we're eating. By the late 1800s, in addition to this, now we've kind of moved up a few years, industrial chemistry was rapidly expanding and it was viewed upon the, the public as the salvation for many of the society's ills. The food industry was one of those that latched on to chemistry and what it was doing to use new chemicals to make their food more visually appealing, such as adding arsenic to peas, canned peas, because it would enhance the green color and the color would never fade and made the peas appear to be much more fresh when you pull them out of the can. As of 1890s, remember, there was little effective means for refrigeration for transporting and storing milk and meat. Therefore, the packing industries, Armour, Libby, Swift, Heinz Ketchup, 
the ones that were big in that day and by the same way had one of the largest lobbies in the United States Capitol had basically, uh, <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that, go away. Um, they had lost millions of dollars, I had thousands of dollars, but probably more than that, of spoilage. So they embraced the use of a chemical currently used by undertakers called preservaline and incorporated into milk and canned meats. We know this chemical as formaldehyde. Well, chemistry provided not only uh, means to make meat and milk last longer, but also, again, to make food look more appealing. And I mentioned to you arsenic being added to peas. But hard candy was colored with metallic and coal tar dyes, giving a very bright color by mid-century. And these included the green came from arsenic or copper. Yellow came from lead chromate. Rose and your red colored candies had red lead in them for coloring. It wasn't in England in uh, 1845 to 1860 that dozens of children in England were killed by ingesting these hard candies. Because what do kids do with candy? They eat as much as they can. And each dose was a dose of some of these compounds used in the coloring. In 1879, a US congressman in the United States who was forward thinking actually introduced a bill that would have outlawed interstate commerce of altered food. It never made it out of committee. There was too much emphasis or too much lobbying power to get legislation through at that point. Because those companies that I mentioned to you were in Washington, D.C., and they owned congressmen. So it was into this chemistry expanding phase of the Industrial Revolution that Harvey Washington Wiley born, was born, grew up, and entered the profession. And he also found his life's calling. Now, Harvey is a local Hoosier. He was born in Kent, Indiana, down south. You can see Cincinnati and Louisville on the map there, about 100 miles from the log cabin where Abraham Lincoln resided. Uh, unlike city dwellers, he grew up working the land and eating off the farm, the produce that they made with their own hands. But his father was ahead of his time. His father, even though Harvey's schooling was minimal, his father would read to his children every night from Harper's Bazaar or Harper's Magazine and other things that would basically tell them about the world in little old Kent, Indiana, in the middle of nowhere. And he also challenged his children to think about the issues of the day. Think about where their role is was in society as far as addressing these issues. And that's why he included on his reading list the, the chapters that were published in the newspaper of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, Preston Wiley was a lay minister in addition to being a farmer. And he had very strong convictions, including being an abolitionist. In fact, the Wiley household was Indiana's southernmost stop on the Underground Railroad, where slaves would cross the Ohio River, make it to their farm, and then under uh, darkness, he would take them to the next stop farther north on the Underground Railroad. Well, Harvey Wiley was preparing to go to college because, again, his father and mother had really insisted on an education when the Civil War broke out. But in spite of their strong feelings of being abolitionists about slavery, slavery, Harvey's parents insisted, insisted that he go to college. And so he attended nearby Hanover College. A year later, however, Harvey decided personally that he could no longer stand aside and watch what was going on in the Civil War. So he enrolled and they're listed in the 137th Indiana Volunteers and mustered out of Indianapolis in May of 1864. And off he went to war. Well, fortunately for the 137th, their job was assigned to be guard duty on the railroads in Georgia and Tennessee. And I didn't see a whole lot of action there, other than the fact that the entire unit fell to a disease of measles that swept through the camp and remained in their camp until they actually mustered out in September of that same year. Harvey actually returned home, was still recuperating or trying to recuperate from his measles. He returned back to the farm. But he left the army with the rank of corporal. And if you read his autobiography, he makes it a point to say it was not only the rank of corporal, it was the fourth level corporal. <laughs> <laughs> so after recovering from his measles, he returned to Hanover and he earned his bachelor degree as well as his master of arts in 1867. His work ethics and convictions that he learned so well from his father's own examples really came through as he was looking to see what he did. He was determined that he wanted to do something for mankind. And so to him, 
Becoming a physician was the noble intention that he would do to be able to serve mankind. He enrolled in and graduated from the Indiana Medical College that was located in Indianapolis in 1871. However, by his own admission, quote, my aversion to shedding blood and causing pain was so great that I felt I would never succeed in surgical practice. Uh, it's like being a veterinarian who hates animals, okay? It's, uh, yeah. So he didn't know what to do. He had this noble dream, but this wasn't really gonna be the pathway that he thinks he could take. So after graduating from medical college and teaching chemistry in an Indianapolis public school for a while, he found he stumbled into his life's passion by actually teaching high school students chemistry. And that was chemistry to help mankind. Therefore, he enrolled at Harvard to study chemistry. And four months later, four months later, <laughs> he graduated from Harvard with a Bachelor of Science degree. And it only took four months to do that, okay? Chemistry wasn't a really big field, apparently. So anyway, after he did that, he came home to Indianapolis. Yeah, but now what? Okay, so now he's at another crossroads. I've got my degree. Now what do I do? I'm not going to go back to Indianapolis and practice medicine because I can't. I don't like blood. Okay, but he had passion to do good and right. The direction to channel it eluded him. So after returning to Indianapolis, he kind of fell into a couple of different jobs. Three of them, to be exact, okay? Three different institutions wanted him to teach. Well, he actually juggled his schedule around for these three different institutions. And so he was able to teach at all three of them simultaneously, something we would never do today. But in the morning, he would start out at Northwestern Christian University. We know it as Butler University, okay? Teaching chemistry classes in the morning, followed by high school classes from one o'clock to four o'clock, where he taught Latin and Greek and chemistry. And then he taught physiology at the Indiana Medical College from 4 till 10 p.m. So his day started every day at 6 a.m. and ended somewhere around midnight. For a young strapping man, and he was a strapping guy, Harvey was over six feet tall. Okay, as you'll see in many of the pictures where he's standing besides other people, he was a tall man, kind of a big burly guy. During his very busy period, what he did, he would often crash at the home of, of a certain Colonel Harper and his wife who were, who were living near Butler's campus. It was convenient. So he'd simply go in there. He made friends with them, the family. Uh, they were very welcoming. And he would just simply crash there for the night, get up the next morning, do the same thing again. I put down here, note the name, Harper, because we're going to see that name again. But he spoke of this in his diary. Every day was a joy. With three salaries, I considered I was on the road to early wealth at the price of $1,400 a year, okay? Which was a lot of money back then, okay? However, his schedule weakened him, this onslaught. And in February of 1874, he was stricken with cerebral spinal meningitis, essentially paralyzed, with an additional infection of erysipelas below his right knee. Now, erysipelas is a disease that can be entered through it. It's usually bacterial, or it is always bacterial where you enter a small cut, it gets into the superficial lymphatics in the area and simply uh, destroys the tissue. It produces, the bacteria produce a toxin that destroys or kills tissue. Um, in people, it can be very serious. And of course, back then, today, we treat it with penicillin, penicillin, advanced penicillin drugs. Back then, nothing of the sort. But Wiley fell into a coma because of the cerebral spinal meningitis. For three weeks, he hovered between life and death. Wiley entered his semi-comatose state in February, on the morning of March 17th, he awoke. On the day he awoke, he found one of his surgeon companions who he had worked with at the Indiana Medical College with a saw in hand, ready to amputate his leg to save him because his infection was so bad in his leg. Harvey's request, looking up at him with a very weak voice, he croaked, doctor, let me die whole. Well, the doctor, the physician, figuring this was a request, last request from a dying man, spared the leg, went in surgically and debrided the wounds as best he could, trying to remove as much infection as he could. And lo and behold, Wiley slowly began to improve over three months, an agonizing three months where he had to learn how to walk again with his right leg being so badly infected. The fever had been so great, he writes, I lost much of my skin over the leg and almost all of my hair. 
up to the time, I had the most abundant and glossy black hair. It never regained its quality or luster after the experience. I find it interesting that he almost lost his leg, but what he writes about his diary is his hair. <laughs> In August 1974, so again, that fall, Wiley received a letter from Purdue informing me of, quote, I had been elected professor of chemistry at this new school, Purdue University. Purdue had not yet started his classes in 74 and was just built a few buildings. <laughs> he was recruited by Mr. A.C. Shortbridge, okay, which some of you may recognize Shortbridge High School in Indianapolis as namesake. Uh, he was also the second president being uh, he superseded uh, Owen, President Owen, the first president. And uh, Shortbridge had been superintendent of schools in Indianapolis and learned about Wiley through his excellent teaching in the high schools while he was down there. So this is actually the contract of, uh, or the notations from the Board of Minutes of the Trustees from uh, that date, July 30th, 1874. Professor Harvard, Harvey W. Wiley of Irvington, Indiana. So his home he actually have is on the east side of Indianapolis is tendered the appointment of professor of chemistry at a salary of $2,000. He actually got a raise, okay? Payable quarterly and quarters rent free. He actually lived in a dorm, okay? But it was free. And so as a young man, this was a good opportunity for him. So he took it. Now, interestingly enough, on Wiley's first Sunday in Lafayette, he was dyed by William F. Reynolds. For those of you who may know a little bit of history, Reynolds was a very wealthy mercantile and railroad investor in Lafayette. And on the evening after they had supper, he took Wiley around to meet a couple other people, specifically Adams Earl, <laughs> Earl Avenue, okay, and Moses Fowler. And so Wiley in his first week there met all the muckety mucks in Lafayette and got to know them pretty well. He maintains uh, uh, good relations with both Adams Earl family and Moses Fowler's family. Now, remember how Wiley lived at the residence of Colonel Harper while he was teaching at Butler? Well, when Wiley left Butler University in 1874 and came to Purdue, the son of Colonel Harper, John B. Harper, who was studying chemistry at Butler under Wiley, followed Wiley to Purdue University. Now, John Harper had already junior level credits from Butler. So when he came to Purdue, he only needed one more year to graduate. And according to Wiley, John took higher mathematics needed for engineering, but quote, but devoted almost all of his time to the study of chemistry in which he was most vastly interested. Well, in spite of Wiley's influence, John uh, Harper graduated with a civil engineering degree from Purdue, but he was a sole member of the Purdue class of 1875, the first graduate of Purdue in 1875, who Harvey Wiley will tell you was because he took him from Butler and showed him the way at Purdue University. <laughs> John Harper had a uh, stellar career as a civil engineer. And he kind of walked away from chemistry and became a civil engineer. So Wiley's, let's call it irrepressible energy, comes through his autobiography regarding his years at Purdue. So I volunteered to teach military tactics because he had harkened back to when he was in the Civil War, okay? And thereupon organized a company of cadets from, quote, boys who came from the country to join Purdue's agricultural school and were not even well enough trained to enter high school. And the bad boys of the city who were expelled from high school and who modestly can be described as rough or tough, okay? So if you can imagine, there was a movie called Dirty Dozen several years ago where he had an individual who scattered together the, the dregs of society, if you will, and basically was successful in, in forming a military unit. That's essentially what Harvey thought he was doing here, was taking these rough, tough kids and showing them how to be military uh, individuals. Our company of cadets, by, Willie's, by Wiley's admission, was probably the best trained company in the state, or so was, okay? He did an interesting thing, though, which would come back to haunt him, but he's, he worked with these boys and he led them by example, meaning they had no formal drilling. They really did not do calisthenics, but what they did instead were things like bowling, gymnastics, and swimming across the Wabash, okay? <laughs> and he did these sort of physical exercises with Wiley in the lead, okay? Um, true to the story, 
and well, with Wiley in the lead, swimming across the Wabash one day when the current was particularly hot, he almost drowned and was rescued by one of his cadets. Now, I don't know about you, but when I walked out of the Wabash, there's barely enough water in there to come up to my knees, okay, let alone drown in it. So must have been one of those times when we had just a lot of rain. A couple of years later, two years later, so we're up to 1876, Wiley attended the Declaration of Independence Centennial in Philadelphia, ostensibly to search for a mineral collection, which he was going to use to teach chemical mineralogy. But he became interested, and I put in these words, or distracted by, the uh, display of two electric dynamos that were being used and the display here. He purchased the smaller of the two Graham dynamos and shipped it back to Purdue. When it arrived in November, the engineers and the chemists worked together to fashion a lamp made from two carbon sticks and placed it in the tower of the chemistry building, which was the highest building of the time. When it was lit by the dynamo, they hooked up a steam engine to actually drive the dynamo. You remember the dynamo is what you always see when you see the, the dams, the water dam. It flows through, drives an impeller, which spins the dynamo. The dynamo converts uh, physical activity to electrical activity. So anyway, when it was lit, it became, quote, the first electric light produced by a dynamo west of the Allegheny Mountains. So the reflector that he actually fashioned up there was like a bright spotlight. And Wiley thought, I'm gonna shine it, shine it on old Moses Fowler's house across the river. So Moses actually reported back to Wiley that when the light was directed to shine on his porch, he was able to read and print, although he was two miles away from the light source itself, which was of course, in the day, this was phenomenal. Moses Fowler was quite impressed by this. In fact, John T. McCutcheon, who at that point was a young lad, living in Ladies Hall, the dormitory, because his father was the commissar or, or chief uh, commissioner of the uh, commissary of the hall, noted the event in his own autobiography and how fantastic it was that this beautifully bright light illuminated the campus and the countryside for miles around. Supposedly the Grand Dynamo was placed in Purdue's museum, according to Wiley, but it's pretty much been lost to time. I can find no evidence of it anywhere in the archives uh, records. So Wiley, who himself was apparently distracted by bright, shiny objects, actually brought one to Purdue University. <laughs> now, the Purdue student newspaper, I'm talking about the Purdue newspaper. This preceded the Purdue exponent by a number of years. If you look in the archives at Purdue, you'll see the contents of the early papers that started in 1875. The creator is Wiley, come, R.B. Washington. He created the first newspaper on campus. And then this, here's the interesting part too. The Purdue Student Newspaper of 1875 was the first new paper issued by Purdue. The newspaper was managed, edited, and largely written by faculty member Harvey W. Wiley. Student, John Bradford Harper, okay, who later became the first graduate of Purdue, assisted with advertisements, printing, and gathering of news items. So again, Gentleman that he brought from Butler with him, the two of them put together to produce the Purdue, the Purdue. That's what it was just called, the Purdue, okay? Which precedes the exponent by 25 years. <clears throat> so Wiley did a lot of things that we don't realize. He developed the first chemistry teaching laboratory on campus at Purdue. He created Purdue's entrance exams for screening applicants to university, something the university had kind of overlooked for their first uh, couple of years. He also did a sabbatical in Germany where he studied under leading scientists and discovered the field of chemical analysis of adulterated food. He had found his purpose. And he came back from Germany with the zeal that would be expected. He actually purchased equipment using his own dollars. I think Wiley had more money than we assumed. Maybe he just didn't have a lot to spend on otherwise, but he actually bought that with his own money. In 1881, he, or he had established himself within the state as the food analyst person. So in 1881, the Indiana State Board of Health asked Wiley to, a fairly simple sort of thing, examine the purity of commercially so, so, sold Indiana honey and maple syrup. Well, that sounds innocuous enough. I mean, he'd been doing research on things like sugars and sorghum, 
okay, and sugars and beets and those sort of things. So this was just right up his alley. Fallout from this study was a harbinger of Wiley's professional life to come. Previous reports had identified that jars of honey sold in Indiana and elsewhere were commonly more just than tinted corn syrup. And they would throw in a honeycomb, throw it in for appearance. But by, now here's the thing, here's the thing again, that we see a recurring theme. The industry that backed the fraudulent use of food additives or adulterated food was huge. In 1881, there were no fewer than two dozen factories concentrated in the Midwest alone that were turning 25,000 bushels of corn every day into corn syrup that was used for a variety of purposes. Now, corn syrup was two-thirds less than sugar cane as far as sweetness, but it was half the price to produce. Therefore, who wanted it? Food producers. Now, what they didn't do is they didn't label their products as such. They labeled them as pure Vermont honey, which didn't come from Vermont, and it wasn't honey, okay? And this was the thing that really Wiley was most concerned about is that the common person was being duped by these companies selling fraudulent products. So Wiley used polarizing light to identify the sugars based on the fact that different sugars will have different polarity or, or refract, refract light differently. What he found, 90% of all Indiana products tested were fakes, entirely free of any what he called bee mediation. There were no bees involved. Many of the honeycombs themselves were even just molded paraffin. They weren't honeycombs at all. So Wiley published his results. See, look where he published his results, both in the state record, which is the official report, but he also went directly to Popular Science Magazine in 1882 and published the same results. Why? This started a trend for Wiley. He was fairly savvy, knowing that if it ended up in the Indiana state record, who's going to read it? Nobody. But because this was a public safety issue in his mind, his thought was, let's let the public know. Well, the pushback was immediate, as you would expect, okay? The corn growers, farmers, and supporters of Purdue's Agriculture College were quite upset. The corn syrup manufacturers, remember the big business that was manufacturing 25,000 tons of corn into corn syrup every day? And sellers of the mislabeled products because somebody was calling them out to be frauds. Oh, horrors. And the beekeepers. Now, this was unexpected. Why would the beekeepers be against Riley's report? Well, because he was, he was casting a light on all honey. People immediately became suspicious of all honey products, not just the 90% that were mislabeled honey, but all products, whether they were, whether they were legitimate or not. <laughs> I thought this was interesting. But there were also many beekeepers, quote, producing honey, quote, who were not bothering to keep any bees, but somehow they produced honey that they sold to manufacturers who produced the products. The maple tree tappers were the only group that supported the study. And all five of them against all 3,000 of the others was not a match, okay? They obviously were outvoted. Uh, their voices were, were rare, barely heard. Well, this is where Wiley, in his usual truthful yet somewhat irrepressive way, started to cause enemies. Conservative members of the Board of Trustees were not happy because they were getting communiques from their constituents out there that agriculture was being attacked. Previously to this honey incident, the state governor had actually hinted to Wiley he might be a presidential candidate for Purdue University. But with this option, that vanished completely off the table. Slowly, criticism and increasing feelings of being stifled mounted in Wiley. He felt like he was being slowly hemmed in. Resources were slowly retracted from his laboratory. In addition to that, his personal life was, was criticized. Now, about the time that this was starting to build, the commissioner of agriculture, George Loring, extended Wiley an opportunity to come to Washington, D.C. to actually work for the USDA as chief chemist. Said, no, not really. I, I like it here. I'm Midwest born and raised and I enjoy it. I enjoy it. So he said no for that. But then the trustees did several other things that eventually drove Wiley away. <clears throat> One, this is a quote. Professor Wiley has bought a bicycle. 
Imagine my feelings and those of our members of the board on seeing one of our professors dressed up like a monkey astride a cartwheel riding along the streets in knee bridges. Oh, the horror of it all. That's what he would have looked like on there. Here's the other one. We are deeply grieved at his conduct, Wiley's conduct. He has put on a uniform and played with the boys, much to the discredit of the dignity of a professor. Remember how we said he led his lads through all the cow sacks and everything in uniform, whatever uniform they used at the time, okay? Yeah, that was, that was beneath the dignity of a professor. And one board member publicly declared about Wiley's research is, it was the devil's tool. With that, by 1883, Wiley was in Washington, D.C. as the chief chemist of the USDA. So that was enough. And that was the end of Purdue's uh, interaction with, with Harvey Wiley. Now, Wiley continued his crusade to identify chemicals and preserve the contaminants in foods, including butter, oleo, and there's a whole section in his book about oleo margarine quote unquote, and really what it was to do. Spices, ketchup, whiskey and flour. And I have to put a little caveat in here. Heinz ketchup was one of the first food producers that actually went along with the idea behind the Pure Food and Drug Act. And they actually used that in their marketing to distinguish themselves from other ketchup products of the time and were very successful in doing so. But they were a lone voice in the wilderness. But Heinz ketchup, we have to give kudos to because they actually got on board with getting rid of all additives. Now, Wiley's charge was to produce data, and that's the key word, data that identified the allowable amounts of additives and preservatives that could be added to food. Wiley was not against additives by themselves. He was a chemist after all, he understood this. What he was against is two things. One, that none of the chemicals were tested to find out what was a safe dose or level. And two, the consumer was not informed when they bought the product. There was nothing on the label to indicate these other products had been incorporated into their food. Those were the two things that Wiley objected to. So to truthfully label each product with its ingredients, that was his mission. As he had Purdue, Wiley's unrelenting search for the truth led him to enemies in Washington, just now on a much larger scale than he had when he was here at Purdue. The head of the USDA, under pressure from lobbyists and powerful food manufacturers and producers, tried to find many ways to muzzle the irrepressible Wiley. For example, it required that all results from Wiley's data be approved before release, limiting Wiley's engagement at scientific conferences, because Wiley, when he would go to conferences, would draw a crowd in with his eloquent oratory and his ability to convince people and his passion, he pulled people to him. Now, the USDA said, no more of that, okay? He limited reports that could be released to the public and the scientific community, and Wiley got around that by a very clever way of actually sending his reports out to one of the best journals in the United States, Good Housekeeping. It was read by every housekeeper in the United States, and he would simply send them small columns of information that then were disseminated to the entire public. And then making what his was, this was kind of the coup de grace, making Wiley part of a quote, three man council who would vote on all actions related to food trials. And two of those three were appointed by the head of the USDA, who was anti Wiley. Rendering Wiley's vote on this three man council pretty much moot. But Wiley persisted. Wiley figured what he needed, in spite of all these muzzlings on him was a test food to test the food additives on real human subjects to show or to identify if there were any adverse effects. Enter the poison squad. Now this group of individuals, this is Wiley right here. And again, you see, he was a, he was a big man and really his hair does not look that bad, right? <laughs> but Wiley posted an ad, a fairly innocuous ad in the building of the USDA for young robust men to enjoy interesting word, six weeks of free food and board as part of the hygienic food trials. He was inundated with volunteers. The reason being, these gentlemen were mostly clerks, paid minimal amounts of money, living in a very expensive city, Washington, D.C. And so they jumped at the opportunity to be able to actually have free room and board for six weeks. So he actually had a large list of individuals who signed up for this. He parsed it out to 12 members, 
initially for his mission group. And the way he ran it was a very simple type of experiment. Half would receive food with precise amounts of additive and half would receive food that was not simple enough for two weeks. Then what they'd do is they would switch groups. The groups, the one with the additive would get uh, non-additive and vice versa. And then finally in the last two weeks of the six week period, he would then switch them back looking for the effects. Now what he was looking for, of course, was acute injury meaning something that would occur within two weeks. What he could not test for was the chronic effect of many of these additives that he was testing. But after, okay, and this kind of goes on, describes it. The test subjects were highly regulated. They could only consume what was fed to them in the dining room. And volunteer observers would actually record everything that they ate and the amount that they ate. Here's the part that many of them didn't like. They had to collect all, quote, excreta, so it could be analyzed for analysis for the product itself and any metabolites of the products that were added. Well, the press began to follow the studies of borax salicylate, so the poison squad. And uh, David was actually asking me about this, about how the names were not known. Well, the names were known, but what Wiley was trying to do was make this a legitimate scientific study. And if this had been today, the memes produced by his study were incredible. People made up minstrel songs about Wiley poisoning his poison squad. Okay, uh, there were posters and cartoons in uh, the um, uh, the magazine Puck, which was kind of a satirical magazine of the time with many cartoons. Wiley was there in every issue. Okay, and so he wanted to be legitimate about this. And so again, when uh, his, the investigative reporters actually found out the names, released him, Wiley declared that the poison squad has have at last been made public. It is a role of honor. Future generations will rise up and declare these men blessed in the true value of their services are known. So we have our heroes of the day, the Poison Squad, okay? So good uh, cookbook authors and good housekeeping advocated for the same idea that Wiley was pushing, additive free food. The American Medical Association took up the cause and in their, um, both publications and their conferences, they advocated the cause of pure food. And finally, public sentiment for regulation of food additives, as you can imagine, now that the information was getting out there, built very quickly. By 1903, the poison squad borax trials. Now this is borax. When I mentioned borax, remember the old 20 mule team borax used for great for cleansing and so forth? Yeah, that was added to your food as a preservative. Now, it doesn't mean it was necessarily bad, although you got to think it didn't taste very good. But what they didn't know was how much of it could you tolerate? And since manufacturers could put as much in as they wanted, you had different manufacturers putting tremendous amounts because if a little bit of preservative is good to keep your product from going bad, a lot more should be even better. Heck, it'll probably last for 30 years. So the squad trials continued with a variety of things, including salicylate. Salicylate is basically the same uh, chemical company as aspirin. Aspirin is acetylsilic acid. Salicylates is a broad category. That was a common preservative because it was an acetic product. The thing they found with it is when you increase the dose with it, you got neurologic effects. So if you had a food that was preserved with salicylates, you could theoretically produce neurologic side effects. Sodium benzoate, which we still find if you're drinking any cans of Coke or anything, you'll see a little thing down there that says sodium benzoate in it. It's still a preservative that is used, but it's used at specific amounts. Copper, salts, and saccharin. Yes, saccharin, the artificial sweetener. We're going to come back again because saccharin really played a big role here. By 1905, enough public momentum had built that legislatures were kind of finally forced into a corner against the wishes of the heavy lobbying groups from the very powerful meat packing and meat producing, food producing companies. And they passed, they proposed legislation to quote, prevent the manufacture, sale and transport of adulterated misbranded foods, drugs, medicines, and liquors. Couple things here. Prevents the manufacture, sale or transport of adulterated misbranded foods, drugs, medicines. As long as you told them there was arsenic in it, they bought it anyway, it was okay. Same thing for strychnine, okay? Same thing for copper sulfate. Oh, hey, it's got copper sulfate, but my peas are green, okay? But I know, okay? In other words, this is what the law did. It focused on fraudulent labeling of foods. 
not on whether or not they were actually safe. But this became the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 and was considered to be a victory for the pure food group. It was also known, coincidentally, as the Wiley Act because not only was it related to his work, but he wrote the majority of the word, uh, verbiage that was in the act itself. The act legislatively assigned, uh, legislated, assigned Wiley's department to enforce and administer this act. But Wiley had made strong enemies in Washington, D.C. Among them was Theodore Roosevelt because of an interaction he had one day at the White House when something like this. Saccharin, which had been, invented, had been invented in Ira Remsburg lab at Johns Hopkins, and I italicize because Remsburg name is going to come up here um, in a bit. Invented in 1879, it was a sweetener. It was sweeter than cane sugar and it was very cheap to produce. And it was a pure chemical. There was nothing organic in it at all. In spite of no determination of any safe dose for saccharin, it was used to sweeten literally thousands of meat and vegetable and other products. When Wiley personally informed President Theodore Roosevelt that anyone eating saccharin was, quote, eating a substance that was highly injurious to health, Roosevelt turned purple with rage. He, he clenched his fist, gritted his teeth, and said, Dr. Rixie, his physician, gives it to me every day. Anyone who says saccharin is injurious to health is an idiot. Just look at me. Well, that didn't go well. Because the very next day, Theodore Roosevelt ordered the USDA to form the Remsen board by the same Ira Remsen, who invented saccharin to actually determine the authority, determine safe levels of all additives. This was what Wiley's job had been assigned by legislation. Theodore Roosevelt basically gutted the 1906 act and gave the power to a group that was the fox guarding the hen house, essentially gutting the, the uh, enforcement of the act itself. No one other than the adulterated food producers, however, were behind this Remsen board, this highly publicized Remsen board. And because of that, the Remsen board moved forward because they had the backing of the president of the United States, but nobody else except the people who were producing the adulterated food. But it was back here in Indiana where the Remsen board met their final fate. Indiana had passed a law that banned the benzoate of sodium as a food additive. So Indiana legislature had picked up the baton of pure food and drug and enacted a law. Well, the Remsen board decided that was gonna be their test case. And with the support of the USDA, because the USDA was full behind them and behind the USDA was the agriculture community and the food producers who were adulterating food, oh, okay. They took Indiana to court to block the ban essentially tried to reverse Indiana's law of banning sodium benzoate. The court upheld for Indiana. So did the appeals court. And so did the Indiana Supreme Court. So take that, Remsen board. And that was viewed, that was very publicly followed. And when they saw that, the Remsen's board or their authority was greatly diminished and really led to their decline and eventually phased out with the USDA. Wiley, as we said, had a good relationship with Good Housekeeping, which in 1905 started publishing a role of honor of pure food products, paralleling Wiley's pure food efforts. And again, you see many of the articles that have Wiley. He actually had his own department in the magazine in his later days. Wiley had used Good Housekeeping, as we said, as an outlet for publishing a result when the USDA forbade him from putting his results in scientific journals. In 1912, Wiley finally was fed up with the Washington politics, what a surprise, okay? And left the USDA and became director of the Good Housekeeping's Bureau of Food, Sanitation and Health, something he did literally for the rest of his life. A Wiley personal life, we haven't said anything about, but Wiley married the long love of his life, Ann Kelton, in 1911 at age 66. I believe she was uh, 36 and he was 66, but they went back actually 10, 15 years because he had proposed to her a decade and a half before. And she had turned him down because he was an old guy and she was very young. So, <laughs> you know, it just didn't match up. But when he turned 66, he met her again on a chance, chance encounter because she was actually a suffragette. She was a very strong advocate and he met her at a rally, reintroduced themselves, rekindled the flame. He proposed a second time and she accepted. They went on to have two sons, Harvey Jr. and John. 
Uh, Wiley died at his home in Washington, D.C. in 1930 at the age of 86. He and his wife are both buried in Arlington Cemetery. While Wiley had won the battle in 1906, the war continued on. In 1906, period food and drugs, as we said, did little to assure the safety, the safety of the adulterated products. It only addressed the trafficking of mislabeled foods. So we had wonderful things like, yeah, Daniel's Wonder Worker lotion, okay, on drugs and so forth, okay? I like that drug, flatulence. I'm not sure it was a trade name or what it was used for, but okay. And then, of course, you had cannabis in the bottle that you could get. Uh, Bayer's heroin, okay, this is a legitimate product. These are all drugs that you can go down to the local drugstore apothecary and get. And, of course, cocaine tooth drops. Now, cocaine was widely used and really was uh, is still used in small amounts as a topical anesthetic. Um, ophthalmologists still use it uh, as a product of cocaine, actually, to anesthetize eyes. But it was used for toothache drops. So here, kid, got a toothache? Take a little cocaine. And these were all legitimate. I like this one. Certified radioactive water. Okay? And this is something you could buy. Okay? But... The Food and Drug and, Mis and Insecticide Administration formed in 27 in response to some of these things became the FDA. It was born in 1931, a year after Wiley's death. Still, Congress did nothing to implement requiring proof that drugs were safe. They still were focusing on truthful labeling, not safe contents. So again, the and this, is, this is kind of interesting. The 1906 law only forbade fraudulent curative claims where it could be proved the promoter intended to produce fraud. You had to go up to Patrick and you had to say, Patrick, I got to prove that in your mind and your heart, you wanted to commit fraud. Now, how hard is that to do? Okay. Because all Patrick had to do was say, I personally believe in my product. Well, in your heart of hearts, apparently you didn't fraud because you believed that your product was good. We could not prosecute you about that. So this all changed in 1937. Article called The Taste of Raspberries and Taste of Death. Sulfonilamide was an early antibiotic that was being used. It was the first antibiotic. Penicillin really didn't come along until the mid-1940s. But it was used to treat strep throat, especially in kids. And it was usually marketed in a powdered or tablet form. The problem was with children who had strep throat, it was pretty hard to make them take a tablet and the powder did not dissolve well in water. It would just form a mushy mass on top of the water. So pharmacists had to look at it, find something that it would dissolve in that would be easier for children to take as a liquid. And so one pharmacist came up with a combination. He dissolved the powder, found that it dissolved in glycol, diethylene glycol, which is pretty common to use glycol type products because they're more like an alcohol and certain things will dissolve in them that will not dissolve in water. And the powder dissolved in it very well. Well, you may know diethylene glycol by its cousin, ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze. And it kills by causing renal failure, acute renal failure. It actually forms crystals within the kidney itself. It actually then destroys the kidney itself. And within a period of about 72 hours after you have ingested it, you are in the phase to aneuric or fatal renal failure. When the FDA realized what had happened, that ethylene glycol, in this case, diethylene glycol, was being served out to it. They immediately tried to track down all the bottles sold and destroyed them, not before over 100 people, mostly children, died from acute renal failure. Finally, there was a disaster, enough to get the Congress's attention. And the next year, in 1938, the Congress passed the FDA and DNC, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that we still have today. A new drug cannot be transported across state lines unless it's been adequately tested to show it is safe. Now, uh, here's see the little out there. It might be unsafe, but as long as you didn't send it out of state, you weren't affected by this law. There's a little out still in there. But the labels had to, to explain potential injurious use of the drug. Regulation enforcement fell to the FDA, but since then, 
laws have now become much more stringent, obviously, in that you cannot even uh, release a drug for marketing before the drug has been proven for safety, regardless of where you're sending it to. So the, the law in 38 said you could transport it out of Indiana, but you could use it in Indiana. This law said you can't even release it before it's been safety tested, and that's the law we have today. So what Harvey Wiley began in the 1870s grew the foundation for the safety that you and I enjoy today with our food and our medications. I began my public career without any idea of being quarrelsome and belligerent, <laughs> but from my entry to public life, I became belligerent in the best sense of the term. I fought with all my power for what I considered to be right, and opposed with all my power what I considered to be wrong. Harvey Wiley. Do you remember Wiley here at Purdue, Wiley Hall? The marker near his home in Kent, Indiana. On his gravestone in Arlington is in recognition of his services to chemistry, agriculture, hygiene, and public welfare. Finally, it was on a stamp in 1956, uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the career food and drug laws, Wiley's Law. If you want to read a good book about Wiley, I recommend this. It's uh, The Poison Squad by Deborah Bloom. It came out uh, about two years ago with it. And uh, it goes into a lot of detail, especially about the politics that there was in Washington. And it will just grill your toes as to some of the things that went on back then. Um, so I've got some things over here that you want to take a look at. Again, I've got the Purdue here. I said that Wiley uh, did a lot of experiments with sorghum and those sort of things, sugar sort of thing. And he actually, met, he actually wrote the book in 1907 called Foods and Their Adulteration, which you can get. Now, this actually, <laughs> this book came from India, because what uh, India has been doing is they have been taking our old um, materials that are public domain, meaning they're not covered by copyright, and they're putting them into books that you can get on order. Okay, so basically books on demand, that they will print them up because what they do is they scan them in, and then they sell these books. So it's kind of interesting that I've been able to get a couple of books, including Wiley's detailed results, uh, results of his uh, Poison Squad Borax experiments, the results of that, the original kind of photocopy, the original thing with that. So there's fun things about there with Wiley, but he was a gentleman who was really ahead of his time, and as you can tell, a very strong advocate. So that concludes our presentation day. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? But yes, sir. USDA. Mm -hmm. So when did that form? Okay, the USDA actually had been around for a number of years back in the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. The difference was that the head of the USDA was not a cabinet member until 1870s or so. He was like simply a commissioner of agriculture with less power. Once he became a cabinet member was when all the politics started because now those who wanted to influence the agriculture and its and what it did could now have a person who had the ear of the president. And so that's when the politics really started with that. And that's right about the time Wiley came in. And so I guess the early years of the USDA was all about the commercial development. Exactly. And all of these issues about safety, and mm -hmm. especially that even the term public safety mm -hmm. just had to exactly. develop over time. Right, exactly. Uh, event, sadly, because of tragedy. Exactly, because we were just trying to get enough food to heat. Yeah. 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 You know, so I want to have a few maggots in it. There's one story I did not tell you about because it's really gross, uh, <laughs> but it relates to, I've got to tell you anyway, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, right before lunch. Yeah, right before lunch. We talked about how meat packers with canned meat, which became very popular in the 1800s, uh, late 1800s, as a way of sending meat overseas. When we had the Spanish-American War, meat had to be sent to Cuba. And so Armour got the contract to develop meat that they would pack into their cans and then send to, with preservatives, like uh, pro preservaline, okay, formaldehyde, would send to our troops in Spanish-American War, Teddy Roosevelt being one of them. The stories that they have behind that are troops opening the cans, and if they hadn't been well-preserved in Cuban heat, which they weren't, Okay, the smell, you can imagine what it was, okay? And the smell that was only worse than the rotten meat was the smell of the chemicals that came out of the can. A captain came by and saw one of his troops pouring out his can of armor-packed meat and said, why are you doing that? 
says, because I cannot eat it, sir. He says, this is the only food you're going to get. You eat that, soldier. He did. And he promptly vomited everything he had. He then handed the can to the captain, who looked at it and said, I understand. The testimony that came afterwards was called the embalmed meat scandal. Because literally the meat that was going over there had chemical preservatives enough that it could have embalmed a corpse, but failed to actually embalm appropriately the meat that was being sent by Armour, Swift, and other meat packers to support our troops. Our troops in general, one report stated, lost on average about 70 pounds in their time over in the Spanish-American War because they did not eat the rations provided to them by the United States. While they were risking their lives, their lives were in danger from the meat the United States was sending them. So it's an interesting little story that goes with that. So, okay, good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm surprised uh, Wiley didn't meet up with uh, Colonel Lilly, who after the Civil War started a drug company in Indianapolis. Yep, yep, that's good. And they probably did cross paths because, again, of the chemistry background with that, but there's nothing in his diaries to indicate that he really ever interacted with Lilly or some of the other companies that were coming on at that time. Uh, perhaps because, if nothing else, Lilly was not doing anything really quite as heinous as the snake oil salesmen that were producing products. Lilly's products, if you look at especially their old bottles, they told you exactly what was in them. And because of Lilly's uh, stringent policy on purity of drug, he really wasn't in that group of adulterated drugs. Yeah, it was a good point. Good point. Uh, there is a Wiley Hall on the IU campus as well. Is that oh, the same? Right. Uh, I do not know. It's named after Wiley. That could well be, but I, it makes sense. It would make sense it is. So great. I didn't know that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom. Tom I Turpin. I comments that you were picking on the beekeepers earlier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> the corn syrup people eventually won. Mm -hmm. because if you go to McDonald's or any fast food place and ask for those packets of honey, it'll be at least 30% corn syrup. That's right. So they, they passed a law which would allow you to incorporate that in there. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, in things we did at Purdue some years ago, when the students did taste tests of honey, mm -hmm. you know what they liked the best? <laughs> exactly. McDonald's honey, which is 30% exactly. corn syrup. Exactly. But because they hadn't eating pure honey for the most part. That's right. And, and Tommy, make up a big point. Now, one of the big differences between the, the corn syrup that's produced now and the corn syrup that was produced then is that the corn syrup that's produced now is what we call high fructose corn syrup. It's a slightly different formulation than what they had back then, which was a pure glucose type solution with that. So it had a little different flavor to it, but you're right, Tom, that high fructose corn syrup, that is sweet stuff. <laughs> sweet stuff. Good. Thank you. John. One thing to talk about uh, Lily, uh, actually in 1883, which was about the time while they was taken on, uh, a, a pharmacist physician in Annapolis who was close to Lily came to Purdue and said, you need to start a school of pharmacy. And, and they have a legitimate, you know, because they're, they're putting all this junk out there, uh, damaging people. So that, that's how our, our pharmacy school started. So Lily had an indirect influence on uh, getting that going and supported and still supports it today. It's really, been, it's been really generous. Yeah. In fact, uh, Lily got his start here in Lafayette, as I recall. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, hey, great thing. Like I said, you probably learned something you didn't know when you came in. So there we go. We accomplished our goal. You guys have yourselves a good day. Thank you for coming. Yes, sir. 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 Y